What's up, everybody? Welcome to Another Black Girl. This is my space where I'm highlighting the passions, pursuits, and general excellence of other Black women and girls that I think are dope. So I'm Keisha G, and today I am joined by a talented artist and a woman who I greatly admire and appreciate so much, Jamie Todd. Welcome, Jamie. Hey. Hey, girl. <laughs> so before we get into our conversation about your life and your artistry and all the things, I want to read the people your bio so they know who we're dealing with. All right. So Jamie Todd lives and works in New York City. She earned her bachelor's degree from Michigan State University and her law degree from the University of Miami School of Law dealing with a legal ego, y'all. Her background as a painter has fueled her current body of abstract photography work that she refers to as inkscapes. She has incorporated this practice into her ongoing series entitled Belle Noir, which celebrates Black womanhood through abstract portraiture. Mm-hmm, Black womanhood. Todd's work has been shown at the Rutgers University of Newark, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, National Black Theater, the Mint Museum Uptown in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the New York Mercantile Exchange, as well as a number of private galleries. She is a regular contributor to Postcards from the Edge, an annual charity benefit that supports artists living with AIDS in New York City, and her video installations of her work have been used to highlight the water crisis in Flint Yes, girl. Todd has been published in Mfong, the women's photographers of the African diaspora and Radar Station magazine. Snaps for Jamie <laughs> with such a meaty, meaty bio. I receive your snaps. <laughs> it takes a while to get to the place in life where you can receive the snaps. <laughs> All right. So we, um, before we get into the conversation, because I have so many questions, I can't wait to share with people and be myself, learn a lot about your journey to being the Jamie that you are today. Um, I have to acknowledge that we are having this conversation the day after finding out that Ruth Bader Ginsburg has passed away. And I think for, for any person who cares about equality or even just the you know empowerment of women in any spaces of influence i think that it's a solemn day for a lot of people so i was i received that news and then i was like everybody else definitely my first thought was <laughs> those are my exact words too <laughs> <laughs> and then i saw your comment, you were, you know, sharing some words on another, uh, in a post, I think, on Demetria L. Lucas's uh, Facebook page, just kind of reminding people, like, hey, check out this tweet that lets you know, like, I know everybody's feeling, you know, that sense of despair right now, but, and then I was just like, okay, okay, Jamie's coming with the but, giving me something else to think about in this time of despair. Can you tell us a little bit why, like, what you posted and, and why you thought that was important? Well, it was basically reposting what a lot of Black activists were going on and saying like, hey, listen, you know, she fought until the very end, you know, multiple rounds of cancer. She held on as long as she could. So we got to take that energy and put that into our own fight and not give in to despair. Because just like you, I had an immediate reaction. All kinds of expletives were flying and stuff because, you know, I was just sitting here like thinking about the next, you know, 20, 30 years with this implied. And it's so easy to want to curl up in a corner and I'm just kind of like yeah I'm kind of tired of curling up and, and rocking back and forth and being frightened or you know just feeling like I'm powerless I'm just I'm, I'm done with that mm -hmm. and I in times in the past where I felt like my back was up against the wall and I felt despair my mom always taught me it's like you got to just face it head on and just strategize and start forming a plan and just kind of like stiffen your spine and like this is what we're going to do and so I just wanted to pass on the energy that I was seeing out there where people were just kind of like, you know, we have to, we can cry, it's okay to cry, it's, it's normal for us to want to commune in this moment to remember, but then the next morning we wipe those tears off and we fight. And I think as Black women, we've known that all our yeah. lives. We've had that pep talk from our grandmothers and our mothers and stuff. And it's just kind of like, for those of y'all who may not be used to this, you know, this is kind of our wheelhouse. So let's just pass this energy on and let's just, let's get to the work. Yeah, it didn't take very long after I saw your words, you know, reposting the activist words. I was like, you know what, that's correct. 
and everybody's like, oh man, look at the hypocrisy, you know, they're trying to fill the seat and making these statements so quickly after, you know, we're all finding out in her, by her passing. And my brain, because I had already slipped the switch then to the fight mode, I'm like, look, y'all, stop being surprised. Mm -hmm. This is not, this is not a, a, a debate and a negotiation. This is a pretty much combat. So right. ain't nobody trying to be like, well, let me align with what I said last time when I was trying to, you know, take power. Nah, this it's just a coup is going down. And so this is right. how it's gonna be. So it's it's fight mode. It's a battle. That's right. Um, I'm with you, girl. Thank you so much for for getting being part of that that cycle of rallying the folks. So whew, yes. <laughs> we honor our sister, notorious RBG. And definitely I got to a space of gratefulness for her service. Um, and I wanna not be robbed of the opportunity to just be like you woman, you you did your thing. Her her life, she made sure her life counted and she made sure it mattered. And at the end, I think that it was a shame that it had to matter so much and have so much hang on one person. Yes, yes. And I think that, you know, like once again, I think we have to use that energy and like not let ourselves get bogged down in the cynicism or disillusionment because that's the whole point is yes. the cynicism so oh it doesn't matter now we're let's just give up and just lay down and die i'm like that's the point is to demoralize you into in action and it's like yeah. let's not do that let's just like you know turn this into a, a moment of alchemy and turn this from pain into like a fight let's fight let's go Ooh, absolutely so look with that now let's <laughs> get into let's get into who you are because i do want people to to know more about this woman here who i love to be inspired by and motivated by and listen to and whose art is all over my house in several rooms so jamie can you tell us a little bit about the you know the you before this bio begins we pick up in your story here is got you in college you're already you know off on the on your path but tell us a little bit about the jamie before before and beyond the bio. What's okay. not in this paper? Well, if we go before the bio, it's going to be like when we're about, I don't know, five years old, when I started drawing all the time because I wasn't old enough to write my own stories. I always had little stories in my head and pictures in my head, but I didn't know how to put it into words. So I would just doodle them. And my mother would look at these drawings and was like, gosh, they're so expressive. You know, there's so much emotion and energy. And then growing up in our house, my sister is also an artist. She draws and she plays the flute. So we were always surrounded by creativity. And that was very intentional of my mom. She's like, I want my children to be in the arts involved in some way. So when we were kids, she'd fill up the bedroom with artwork by like Peter Max, um, May Lou Jones. So we were always mm -hmm. surrounded by creativity and color. And she always encouraged us to have that outlet. So you know, throughout like elementary school, childhood, up into high school, I was always creating, making like birthday cards for my friends and drawing them. And people would save them as like souvenirs. And like years later, people were like, I still have the card from like 20 years ago. So, like, yeah. so it was always there for me. And then, you know, when I got into college, I was at that crossroads where, you know, you're trying to decide what you want to do. And it was like, I had this tug, like, well, I still don't want to give up on the art. Um, I wanted to go to art school and my mom's like, you know, that's nice, but you know, let's be practical here because, you know, oh, the P word, gets the P practical. word, let's be practical. practical, you know, um, especially when I was thinking about in the choosing between law school and, you know, possibly going to art school, I'm like, why can't I do this? And my mom's like, you know, you can still do the practical route, but don't just give up on the art that in itself can be revolutionary because, I think what she was trying to make me understand and what I really appreciate now is like, it doesn't have to be an either or, like you either have to be an artist or you have to be a lawyer or you have to be this. It's like, why can't I do both? You know, and, and in many ways it's learned to balance it out. So I got to law school um, and I was going through my three years. And let me tell you, <laughs> something about law school, it just does something to the creative mind where it was weird because my creativity actually went dormant for a while. Like. Mm. I just did not have any desire to draw or create because with law school, everything's so analytical. You're just reading, 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 analyzing, and you're just filling your brain up with all this stuff that there's just not much room for anything else. So like I would try to sit down and paint and I was just like, yeah, I don't want to. Like the mm -hmm. best I could do was maybe crank out a birthday card for a friend, but I mean, that's where it really ended. So by the time I got out of school and I was looking at coming up from Miami to New York, it started coming back, the creativity and the desire. It was like, almost like I had been frozen for three years. Hmm. And then it was just like, it was starting to unthaw. So 
while I'm going here in New York, I pass the bar and I'm looking for legal work, you know, this is kind of like that little voice in the back, like, what about your creativity? What about this art? You know, are you just, are we just done? You know, I'm just mm. like, no, we're not. Because throughout this, throughout my childhood in high school and college, there's always that pool of coming to New York and pursuing art. Even when people were telling me like, no, you don't need to go to New York. We have enough artists, you know, I was just like, no, you know, the voice gets just mm-hmm. kept telling me like, you got to just start, you know, you got to get back into it yeah. because it's a piece of yourself that you mm-hmm. lost for a little bit and you got to get it back. So you are taking art courses throughout college? I did take some classes at uh, LCC, let's live at community college, you know, back home. And I had a watercolor class. So that's kind of like where it kind of started with what I'm doing now. That's kind of like the bridge. And it just, that kind of kept me sane because it was just kind of like painting was just kind of like, once you do it, this is something happens within you, you know? And I just missed that kind of like, I don't know, it's like some warm, fuzzy feeling to, to describe it. So when I got to New York, I was still doing like art classes here and there. But one thing that I kind of noticed is that when you're pursuing this creativity, I started noticing how art was kind of, it went from being a joyful practice into something else because the art scene in New York is so competitive and everybody's Mm. fighting for that seat on the table. And when you're always fighting, you feel like you're at war, it doesn't bring out the best in you. So like I would take classes at the Art Students League, which was a prestigious uh, school here in Manhattan, here in New York, and you would feel this energy that I felt in law school, that competitiveness, you know, this this nastiness. And I'm just kind of like, I didn't feel like people were competing, uh, com- creating from a joyful place. And I was just mm. like, yeah, that's not for me. So I kind of just stopped and started just kind of like creating, um, doing the paintings, which, you know, when I met you, mm. but what you, you know, I was doing and then getting into photography. And then I was trying to find places to exhibit and people were just kind of like, no, nah, no, you know, you don't have the pedigree. You don't have the background. You don't have this, you don't have that. And it was just always just like, no, nah, you know what? You know, I'm not going to ask for the seat at this table. I'll just like, you know, build my own damn table. Hello. And so, you know, instead of trying to get into like these prestigious circles, I just kind of like created my own circles. And so after a point, when I started doing photography, um, after I was doing painting for so many years, I started getting into street photography and I was like, you know what, I'm going to do my own solo exhibition, which is when we did Visions in New York and Brooklyn, you know, yes. um, I remember it was a pop-up show and yes. I started putting up, I had a one night show where I put up about 20 pieces of my photography and people came out and supported. And it was just kind of like, you know, instead of waiting for someone to give you that dot on that art resume, you just make it yourself. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest takeaways I got from that experience that gave me a lot of momentum to keep pushing is um, people told me like, you know, I didn't know this was possible. Because so many people we know, as you know, have this creative background, but they've been told by society, no, you can't do that. You're not trained, you don't do this. So when I was able to do that, people are like, oh, now I know what's possible. I can yes. pursue that in my own life. So that's kind of like, you know, the before, you know, mm-hmm. that's where we are now. It's so interesting when, I, when you say the people were, you know, very competitive. What were they competing for, do you think? Well, I feel like they were kind of competing for a certain kind of recognition because what was interesting about the art classes is that if you're being taught by teachers that kind of had this own bitterness because everyone wants to be able to have a career where they make a living solely off their art mm-hmm. and let's be real that doesn't happen for everybody now all of us can be kahende where we're dropping like people are paying quarter million dollars for our art it's just very very rare and the reality is that a lot of people have to have day jobs to be able to support what they really want to do in their passion and so i would see that energy coming from the professors where they were just like lashing into their students you know it's just like this bitterness that they had and they were just kind of like you know projecting it on the students the students would receive it and it's kind of like you know almost trying to squash their dreams even before they got a chance to like oh you're bringing up memories girl right i know i know i I don't know if it's showing on my face but as you're saying this i have a very specific art professor from uh, my time is filming in mine Mm -hmm. that really stepped on my spirit when in his painting class and I never understood where the bitterness and the, the that vibe came from because I wasn't really plugged into the world. Mm-hmm. I just was like, I don't understand this energy and why you would want to have negativity in a creative space like this where we're supposed to be feeling fed and nourished and we're blossoming. It was it was one of um, one of the least nurturing professors that I remember having, and I just it, it soured me on continuing the learning of painting. 
like being in an instructional space. And it just like, I was like, if I'm going to do any of this, it's just got to be completely out of a space like that. I can't have somebody telling me. I remember that story because I think what it was is that they couldn't believe that you had created something so good. Yeah, it was yeah. His, his, um, he had a, a teacher assistant or, or a professor assistant in the course. And that assistant was like teaching us. It was, we were making self portraits and he was teaching us about like not using just like the out of the box brown and like creating your own skin tones and all these things. And I just really took to that. And I loved that part. I, I spent weekends like working on my self portrait, trying to like get my brown right. And I was, it was a huge picture too. It was a giant painting. And I would be in that studio every weekend. And the, and the teacher's assistant was like, definitely he was coaching me because mm -hmm. he saw how excited I was. But at the end of the day, the professor just thought that the dude had done the painting for me. And I was crushed, devastated that I had put so much into it. And I'm learning. So it probably looked just like too influenced by how he painted. But the mm -hmm. fact of the matter is I'm taking instruction, but it's my work. Right. And the, to have somebody accuse me in that moment is something that I labored over. And I did, look, I wasn't studying over the weekend for no other classes. Like for mm -hmm. at this point in time, it's like freshman year, I think. And I just was so sad, so sad mm -hmm. to have somebody who was very admired at the school. And, you know, everyone thought he was a great artist. I never forget that man's name. And there's a lot of people who have wronged me who I forgot their names. But that was such an insult. That I see his face as clear as day to this day, and I'm gonna have to light a candle and be like, Oof. right. Girl, but you just... know, it, it's a, you know I've had a very similar experience just like that, where yeah. I was taking a painting class by this woman, and uh, she I was doing a portrait of uh, my boyfriend, and it's like people are looking at it and it's like, oh, this skin tones and stuff, and she was walking by, you know, giving critique, and she just bypassed me, and I said, are you, are, can you give me some critique? Well, I was hoping you wouldn't have to ask. Like, I really don't want to have to say what I'm going to say. And then she just went in. And it was like, to the point, you could tell, like, this is something else. This isn't about a picture. This isn't about, you know, like, it was, you know, I mean, I dare say it could have been like, you know, I was the only Black girl in the room. So it was just kind of like, well, she was criticizing my choice of skin tone. Like, well, is his skin really that dark or, or the ch tones? I was just like, ooh, sis. You know, and <laughs> at that point, I was just kind of like, and even just pearls. Right. And, and it's one of those moments where you just can't like a deer in headlights moment. Like, are you really saying this? I'm like, where is this coming from? This is not about an art critique. This is personal. This is something where you feel threatened and you feel like you got to take someone down a peg. Yeah. And when you tell me your story, that's what I think of. It's like, you know, that teacher somehow I think felt threatened by your budding potential. Yeah. It felt like, well, I studied and did all this and how dare this girl come in here and just create this beautiful work, you know, and I feel like that's what I see, like, too often in the art world, it's like, you know, you see somebody that could be an upstart or could upstage you, you got to, you know, squash that and shut it down. And you see that discouragement, which I feel like is so tragic, because it's kind of like, you know, after that day, I didn't go back to her class. I just went, I went to the verse. I was like, I want a refund because I'm not going to wow. be sitting here and dealing with this, Taking you know. That, no. no, you yeah. know, and it's like, yeah, I mm -hmm. can sit here and try and prove to you that I, I'm good. I don't need to, I know what I have. So mm -hmm. it was just like, give me my coins back, you know, and wrote a scathing review and kept it moving. But that's kind of a sad part about the art world because it's like, there's so few seats at the table. Everyone's fighting for scraps and it's, Kind of like people kind of beating each down to get that scrap which is ironically very much like how law school was mm. At law school they tell you like only 10 percent of the graduating class can get these high powered positions at these big firms so from day one you're pitted against each other wow. and so people are doing all kinds of stuff to bring people down they're like making snide remarks they're hiding books in the law library girl so you, not hiding the books in the girl law they, library. they hide the books they mislead you they you know they won't share outline it's, Look, it's a, let me sip my coffee I... <laughs> <laughs> it's real i am and picturing I'm, people hiding the books in the library like i need this when it's my time i don't need nobody else they, to have access like girl it's real or like you know you have outlines for a class and you get somebody to share no i'm not sharing my outline because i need to have the upper hand like hmm? it's yeah, like i, I don't cut and that's yeah, and that's so, like, that's so against, like, how I, like, operate, you know, I'm not an overly competitive person, I'm just trying to, like, live my best life, yeah. I will cheer you on if you're doing well, but it's not, like, there's enough room 
for yeah. everybody. Well, this is what I love about you saying you may, you know, make your own table because the com competition when I hear it is coming from this place of like this heightened value and um, necessity of those few seats that exist or mm -hmm. those few accolades that exist in a, in a value that's placed on them as if they are so, that's my existence. I need to get to those things that everyone has valued so highly. Whereas you get to that place in your life of, wait a minute, the, doing the thing is what I want to do. So let me make a lane to go do it. And that's what it sounds like you did. You just were like, I'm going to make a lane where I can do my things. Mm -hmm. And that, it's like, you, you get there and because like, when you're going to those heightened spots, when you get there, you know, you go in those circles, you kind of find like they're a little overrated, you know, like, <laughs> no, it's just kind of like, oh, this is what I was fighting to get in. Like when I've gone to some of these art exhibitions and you meet the celebrities or stuff, it's just kind of like, uh oh, okay. You know, like this is what I would kind of like stab somebody in the back for. Yeah. That reminds like Michelle Obama had said something with, in, in, when she was doing an interview and becoming, she was like, you get into the room and then you look around and you're like, is y'all? This is it? <laughs> So I, I think it is an eye opener and as much as people who have gotten a look in can look around and come out and say, wait a minute, okay, folks who are coming up right now, you might just want to go ahead and decide how might this feel good to me and create that space for yourself because see, you right, girl, sometimes you get there and you're like, this ain't even a way I want to live. No, it's not. And I think at this point in my life, I realize it's about forging your own path. And I'm grateful that we have these tools where we can like, like you have your own platform through technology because, you know, at Zoom and you have all this editing software. So you can create that space where you talk to other Black women that are inspiring. You know, you have tools like Instagram where I as an artist can showcase my art. I can sell directly from you know, my home, instead of having to rely on a gallery that's going to take like half of whatever I sell, you know, and, you know, kind of take the notoriety and run with it. So um, I, I think at this point, I've realized that like some of the spaces that you were dying to be in aren't really what they're cut out to be, you know, all that glitters really is not gold, you know, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's just the, the, the prize is really kind of like creating that space for yourself and being mm -hmm. authentic, living authentically for yourself. Yeah, and even if it might be gold, you might look better in rose gold. So then you're just like, it's just not for me. This might, mm -hmm. this is for somebody else. I mm -hmm. need to go find the rose gold. Yes, absolutely. Mm. So, all right, well, you were giving us the, the walkthrough photography. How do we go from the street photography into Inkscape land? Like, tell us about the Inkscapes and how mm -hmm. this particular signature, as I like to call it, you got one hanging up behind you. I'm like, how does this signature Aunt Jamie Todd Inkscape style come to be? So after I got done doing that pop-up show with the street photography, I kind of got bored really quickly because I'm just kind of like, okay, you know, I can only photograph so much, you know, street photography. And I felt like it was something everybody else was doing and I just wanted to try something new. So I kind of went back to my roots, so to speak, when it came to painting. So when I used to do watercolor painting, you know, or mm -hmm. acrylic painting, you know, you, you know, you do your paint, you dip the brush in the water, and you see all the little clouds that form when you clean yeah. off your brush. So I'm sitting here like, you know, what would it be like if I tried to photograph that? You know, just something different. And so I just started going online and looking on tutorials and how to like build like a, like a kind of a water tank and how I could like photograph paint and water. So it's like, I started researching, I started buying like my little materials and I just started experimenting. And I just kind of fell in love with it because it was kind of like combining the best of two worlds. Cause I love photography, you know, like the thing about painting is painting is labor intensive, you know, like for me it is, you know, I'm not one of those people that can just crank out paintings all the time. I would do a painting like once or twice a year and I'd be like, okay, I'm done, you know, cause this is like, it's just, you know, the cleanup and the labor behind it. I'm just not that yeah. productive. Photography, you kind of do get that instant gratification, but then you do miss like the hands-on feeling of holding paint and, 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 you know, looking at the forms of it and what the paint does when it comes across a simple, um, a certain kind of medium. So that's kind of where I became obsessed, where I'm just like, you know, going to the store, buckets of like uh, armfuls of paint and dumping it in water and like getting paint all over myself and photographing it and photographing it. So that's kind of how it started. And of course, I'm addicted to color. So it was just kind of like, you know, add that in. It was just like a marriage made in heaven. So I went from that into kind of doing the, the abstract portraiture and bringing that together. 
because it's kind of like, you know, when I come across these forums, you know, I just kind of like, how can I take it to the next level? What else can I do with it that hasn't been done before? I'm always trying to push those different boundaries. Mm -hmm. Like describe for the people, well, I, is this, when you say abstract portraiture, is this some, <laughs> is this yeah, which, which, kind of like this, that. It's kind of like that. You know, what like Jamie Todd original, you know, <laughs> just got to rep, just trying to rep. I have this uh, actual piece hanging in my bedroom. I have mm -hmm. this big wall of beautiful uh, black women images. And I bought this one because I saw he started combining the inkscapes with these portraits of beautiful people from our history, our past and present, or people mm -hmm. that you know. It's just like, this is incredible um and as we you know i'll make sure that we're showing photos of some of these pieces but i am just loving the direction like you just continue to keep taking the inkscape idea or and just morphing it over time mm -hmm. like when when you got to the abstract portraiture stage tell me about that how do we get there and what for people who might be like what did, what do did we mean when we say abstract portraiture it sounds so nice but break it oh, down for the people <laughs> Sounds fancy. Sounds fancy. <laughs> so like at the time I was just like I said before, I was just photographing the 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 paint in the water. And you know, around that time a lot of people are actually, you know, taking that same direction too. And I was like, yeah, I want to do something different with that. I remember a lot of people sending you links like Jamie, this person's doing what you're doing. Yeah. You're like, like, okay, guys. Like, <laughs> right, like, you know, let's 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 take a breath, let's calm down. Like someone's ripping you off, you need to sue. No, I don't need to sue, you know. <laughs> um, so but at that point it was just kind of like I also was into photographing people and you know of course I love photographing my people my community and I kind of wanted to create like this feeling of magic realism where you're kind of combining like these two worlds together where the concrete us are people and then kind of putting them in a landscape that is just kind of surreal and ethereal and I looked at that as like um kind of a way of just kind of embracing a sense of Afrofuturism but also like a form of escapism like we can kind of like transport ourselves from this landscape that you know might sometimes feel violent and not loving and put it in a space where we kind of be free and imaginative and whimsical so it's just kind of like i was combining those two to kind of bring the best of both worlds together to create like a sense of like a soft happy landing for black people and like look this is what we can be to kind of stimulate our imagination so that we can see ourselves more than what society tells us that we can be, to be inspired, to be invigorated by color, to be embraced by something that wraps itself around you. It becomes a part of you. You become like fluid, you know? Yes. And when you're fluid, you can't be confined. You just can't Ooh. be locked in one spot. So that's kind of how it came about. Quotables. When you're fluid, you can't be confined. Okay. <laughs> Just gonna let that marinate in my soul because that 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 hit home. I I have had the pleasure of being photographed by you and turned into I'm not I'll say not one but two of your your Inkscape portraits, uh, and it was a great. I just love that experience of being like to walk into the room. We got the music that makes that that feels good for me. You had the scene set up right. I feel like the internet is on there singing to me. I'm like, yes, yes. We are flowing and being photographed by a black woman who's just giving me this nurturing, beautiful energy. And then when I saw what you did with it, I was just like, now wait a minute. Okay. It's just powerful. It's just, I think it's a it's called Soldier of Love. Mm -hmm. with the, the, there's a big red pulsating for me it just looked like it's I, I love courage and when I look at that piece that you created out of our uh, photo session just like I felt like I just felt like a heartbeat inside of like a, die, a tough situation and I saw courage and I saw fierceness and I just was like I wasn't thinking any of these thoughts when I was in that studio posing but Jamie just came with some vision to just Aww just birth something beautiful i just it was such an honor to like see and like and cool to see the process that you went through at least from the pieces that i got to be a part of so thank you thank you for immortalizing me in an inkscape <laughs> <laughs> but you know that experience is like that was i love that too because you know, i remember when, when i walked in and you just had like you know you're like to me i always say like keisha's like if the sun had a personality if it was a person it would be keisha because <laughs> i mean you just like you know radiate so much energy and i really fed off of that and when i do these sessions with these women it's just it's a really meaningful experience i like to think for both of us because it's like someone's willing to be vulnerable in front of a camera and just be like, okay, I'm gonna let you turn me into a work of art. I have no idea what the hell you're gonna create, but I trust you. 
So I take that really, really, really seriously because I want every woman to walk into that space to feel seen. I want them to feel honored. I want them to feel protected. I want them to feel safe. Um, and so when someone comes back and is like, oh my God, you see me, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, it's kind of like, it's almost like a, an ESP moment. It just feels really, really special and magical. And I'll tell you about this one experience I had with one of the models who she came in and she, you know, was doing the session and she was very nervous, mm-hmm. you know, and she just kind of like, yeah, I really don't do this. I really don't want to, you know, I don't feel comfortable being in front of a camera, but I went to one of your shows and I just, when you asked for a model, I just thought like I should volunteer. So I created this work of hers and um, it's called Gaze. And there's this picture of her where she's looking straight into the camera. She's this beautiful woman. And so she told me later on somewhat recently, she's like, you know, when I was doing that photo session, you had no idea I was going through something very painful in my life. And she was, you know, separating from her husband and um, she it, it was a very difficult experience for her. And she was like, I was in a lot of pain and I, I did not really want to be in front of a camera, but I felt like I needed to step outside of my comfort zone and do that. And so she's like, it's kind of like, when I look at that moment in my life, when I look back at the picture, it's kind of hard because it's like, I know what I was going through at the time. And she's like, it amazes, and people love that image, you know? And she's like, it amazes me that people see that and see me as beautiful when I was in so, going through so much. You know, which I mean, I you know that course got me. I'm like, oh my gosh. Of course, I'm like, you just hold it together now, thinking right. about somebody. Yeah. And a friend of mine who bought it, who uh, owns uh, runs a gallery space up in Philadelphia called Tessera Arts Collective. She's creating a forum for black uh, for women of color who are abstract artists. She bought the piece, and she's like, there's something about this piece that just spoke to me. You know, mm. and she's overcome tremendous obstacles in her life too. And so it was like this moment of connection between two black women who had never met each other, but just felt connected. And so when I told her the story behind the piece, I mean, she was in tears because it's like, these are two women that have overcome like tremendous personal painful obstacles. And then to like, you know, feel like connected through art. I was like, okay, this is why I do what I do for these moments. That's what it's about. That is beautiful. I, I love, I love thinking about someone looking at the image of another black woman in their home that they have never seen but it like it, it gave them a message as well but like that person is there every day in mm-hmm. that house hanging up and just being part of the atmosphere part of the energy and the, there's a story behind each of these people and oh, this is great stuff i love it yeah, i love you. it so you have um i have several postcards here from when you were taking the uh, historical black figures and creating mm-hmm. creating inkscape portraits out of them. And I feel like that for a while, that gave me, there was like a sense of celebration for me in that piece of work. And then I feel like you're still photographing um, or still doing portraits with black people, but it feels like things are shifting a little bit as we enter this tumultuous um, time that we're all dealing with right now where I feel like there's so much, there's like these specific messages I'm feeling from the pieces as opposed to like, we, I felt like I had general celebration with the historical mm-hmm. figures and now we're doing something else. Is that, am I sensing a shift that's real or is I just reading oh, yeah. into the art myself? Okay. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's like, there's no way you can't experience a shift of what, what's going on, you know, first to start out with a pandemic and then, you know, we have the uprisings and then, you know, we're having, our, our democracy is basically on the line and it kind of feels like everything is so overwhelming. And so I think the response to that was to kind of almost kind of, kind of shift within like, okay, you know, we're isolated. So we have to kind of go within ourselves to kind of find like the space of stillness and peace. So I think in a sense, the works have been kind of a little bit more quieter. I mean, there's still like, there's a little, there's glimpses of exuberance, there's glimpses of color, there's softness, but I think, you know, the emphasis now is kind of going on a certain level of like stillness and centeredness where we have this moment to kind of slow down because we're kind of, you know, we're supposed to be on quarantine, but we're supposed to be on lock, sitting down and kind of like meditating, like what got us to this point where we're just kind of rushing around and moving and kind of 
operating on autopilot and then this illness comes and forces us to be still and think about okay what are we doing you know what am i doing in my everyday how am i living my life and then how does that translate into what i'm doing within the community and then from beyond the community on a macro level you know when it comes to our our states our country our cities it, it's just kind of like i think what i'm trying to go for is like let's just be still for a moment because you know we need to have that stillness so that we can do better so that we can grow and that like with some of the pieces I've been doing the last few days, you know, a lot of the work is like black and white, but then you see like a glimpse of something like a flower within like something that looks like a storm. Mm. And I think it's just kind of like reminders, like things do feel kind of like stark and scary and, you know, overwhelming, but within that, there's still that spark. There's still that joy. There's still that flower. It might be very quiet, mm. might feel very still, but it's there. And if you just sit still long enough and let it kind of, grow and, and, and marinate on that, you know, you can draw strength from that. Mm. And what gets you into a headspace where you can focus on that, that glimmer of joy, that spark, that what, where gives it to you so that you could put it into the work? Really, girl, that's about like naps and rest. <laughs> um, you know, so as we've like talked before, like I really got into like the nap ministry, um, mm. which is a, 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 a group or a, it's kind of more of a movement or an idea founded by a woman named Trisha Hersey on, um, I found her on IG through one of my friends. You know, and she's talking about like, you know, we need to rest, you know, we need to lay down and just be still, particularly as black people because we've always historically been used as tools of capitalism to produce, 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 go, 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 go. And all that constant moving and all this productivity is how our worth has been really defined. And she's like, no, that's not, you know, you were enough before capitalism. You are not defined by what you just constantly making. Which is interesting because like when the pandemic hit, people were saying to me like, oh, I bet you're just making all this art. Aren't you just doing all this stuff? Like I'm just sitting in a corner, just huddled away, just cranking out masterpiece after masterpiece. You know, and I'm like, nah, man, I'm just kind of freaked out right now. And I think I just kind of want to just lay down and just, you know, like yeah. think about what the hell is going on. I, I want to be still because like, I'm kind of not okay. So I think that's kind of like where I had to like really make a practice of just like when I get up in the mornings, you know, I take a really long time before I get started on my day. It starts mm. with journaling for like, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, it's sipping my tea. It's literally just staring out the window, looking at the sky. It's going around my apartment, touching my plants and feeling the greenery. It's just, you know, contemplating the clouds in the sky. That's how I kind of reconnect with that stillness. And you need that stillness, I think, as a creative to tap into that that place where you can create something new and imagine if you can't do it if you're frantic and you're moving around. So I've been very, very intentional about that stillness. I've been intentional about saying no to things like people have been hitting me up. Can you do this commission? Can you do this thing? I need this thing right now. No, no, nah, mm. I'm not doing that. You just gonna have to come at me when I have more time or just, this is gonna have to be a no for now. You know, mm. and that's been a really important practice that I've incorporated lately. Yes. Oh, yeah, that, this is, I hope people really soak that in because that when you, you get to the touching of the plants, you can't be anywhere else, but now like you're in that moment mm -hmm. and you're not allowing yourself to be flying off mentally, worrying about things, you're just like being present, nurturing yourself, giving yourself a moment that means something to you. And it doesn't have anything to do with expectations and and things that need to be earned or completed. I love that you're giving yourself that space to just oh, yeah. be with yourself. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a necessity. And that's actually a wish that I have for everybody, which is why I'm creating that work so that I hope it's a visual reminder to someone who looks at it like, hey, you know, slow down, mm -hmm. take a rest, you know, go for a walk, look at the trees. You know, that's really like the intention that I have right these days with my work. Uh, I love that ministry too. And uh, we definitely share a love for that. It was really a revelation for me to process just how much, like how many corners of our lives, like even when you're not at work, you're still carrying those principles of must always be producing and yeah. never just sitting and being and allowing yourself to feel your feelings, think your thoughts, um, breathe your breaths. <laughs> Like, yeah, have your human rest that your body actually needs. So I, I love the NAB ministry too. Shout out to them. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you consider um, yourself 
to be doing like movement work with the with the pieces that you're creating and with with giving people the tools to restore themselves yeah i think that's what it's about for me now you know when i first started creating the work it's just kind of like you know you want just you want your time in the spotlight, you know, you get excited by the notoriety and everything like that. But then it's kind of like when that's over, like when you have your art exhibition and you sip the wine and everybody's gushing about your work and then everybody goes home, it's kind of like, okay, what's next? You know, because it's like, you know, it's a very brief moment in time. And then it just kind of like you move on to the next exhibition and it's where it started to that's where the direction it was going and I didn't like it. It was just like, people were like, when's your next exhibition? When's your next exhibition? And I'm just mm. kind of like, is this all that I'm really doing? You know? And so I think that's why I started taking that direction with like, you know, with the civil rights figures that I was immortalizing when I work, because then it's like, okay, with each post I would share on Instagram, I would offer background so that you get a little bit of history. You know, there are people that I was um, creating work about that people I'd never even heard of. So it's like, okay, so now, you know, you know about this person, go read about this person, go to the library, go buy a book and read what they were about, what their activism was about. Let that inspire you. And so now with what's going on with the elections, I've been um, trying to create work, you know, to encourage people like, you know, we need to kind of participate in the system as imperfect as it is. We have to keep moving towards that. And so it's just a way of just kind of like giving that push that visual reminder. I really do believe in the value of visual reminders and, and, and just kind of like having that, that, that spark to kind of keep you going or to spark your curiosity to learn more. So I really do want it to be a vehicle at this point. Beautiful. Very much in the spirit of, of Nina Simone and the artist got to reflect the times. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for tapping into that. All right, I, I have just a couple more questions for you. Of One of them I want to hear about, like, who is another Black woman or girl who has influenced you in your life? I mean, you mentioned your mother earlier and said, you know, I, was, you get, I got curious about it when you said your mother always encouraged you to um, participate in the arts, but then before she told you, make sure you're being practical too. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I... I I don't want to, I'm not leading you down the mother road and I know, I know how important she is to you. Uh, but yeah, just tell us about another black woman who has influenced you in your life. Well, I mean, just to keep it in the family, I think my sister did influence me. Actually, there's actually a couple of people. So that's really, oh, you know what? Let it roll. Let it roll. Okay. Give us the black women. Okay. So like my sister was um, drawing before I was. So I was always trying to be like my big sister. So I was just like, okay, well, she's drawing. I'm gonna draw too. You know, she was, she did like this comic book art. She was doing the figurative drawing. So that's why, well, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And so that influenced my style when I was first drawing that like um, a lot of the style that I drew in initially was influenced by her work. And it's just, you know, I don't think I would have gone after art if it hadn't been for her just seeing her modeling it for me and what it did for her so i mean that was like definitely an influence and i think for me too like the other one i would say would be maya angelou and the reason is because you know i always admire people that just kind of go just take their own route they don't go like you know the, the well-traveled path they just kind of like you know what i'm just going to do this it's going to be unconventional people ain't going to understand it but i'm going to do it anyway and she was so many things. She was a Renaissance woman. I mean, she was a writer. She was a poet. I mean, she was, a, she did diplomacy. I mean, she, she speaks five languages. I mean, she just, you could not put her in one box. And I just the love Calypso that. singer, dancer. Calypso Man. singing, dan yes. Yes, dancer, you know, mm -hmm. actor. I mean, it's just kind of like, what didn't she do? And it was just kind of like, you know, I think I'd like to do that and I'm going to do it. And people are like, girl, what are you doing? What are you? you know, she's just like, I'm not listening to you. And I, I, I love that. She was fearless and she was a pioneer. And even if she was afraid, she did it anyway. She just faced the unknown with such determination and courage. And I remember reading I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings when I was very, very young and then revisiting it throughout my life and her other books. And it was just always struck me. Like she just, she just, just did what she had to do. And um, I was blessed enough to be able to meet her in person when I was in college, when she came to speak at our school and I was able to go backstage and meet her. And it's like, you know, you read about somebody your whole life and you're just kind mm -hmm. of like, oh my God, this majestic person. And you're just like, oh, you know what you saying? And I just never forgot like how warm she was. It was like, I was talking to one of my aunties. 
Oh like my gosh, you got like, to speak to Mother Maya. Mother Maya with the I auntie am energy. Oh, so jealous. Uh -huh. Girl, it was really, I just never forgot that because it's like, she could have been like snooty and, you know, I mean, I've, I've met people that are like less accomplished that put on more airs. And yet with her, she just brought that loving energy where she like embraced me and she talked to me and, you know, what are you interested in? And like, I actually got a chance to talk to her in Spanish because she's fluent in Spanish and she's giving me advice. And then she, you know, she grabbed my face. And she's like, who's this baby? You know, and like, it's just, I was just like, oh my gosh. I just wanted to just like climb into her lap and just hold on to her, <laughs> you know? And, I, and, I, and usually I'm not really starstruck like that. You know, you see, so like, yeah, okay, whatever. But I mean, with her, it was just like, it just, she just radiated love and energy. And it's just kind of like, that was a reminder. Like, you know, when you get to this place, you know, it's so important that you're able to pass it on because you just never mm -hmm. know who you're inspiring when you kind of let someone know like, yes, I see you, you're worthy. We're here together. You know, it, it's just, it was really, really powerful. So yeah, definitely an inspiration. Ooh, yeah. I, I love letters to Maya Angelou will never get old for me. If mm -hmm. every single person I asked that question wants to talk about her, I will sit here with a smile, like, if you know what she <laughs> like, cause she is so like, she looms large in my life and my heart, just a person who I've never met before to have such a profound impact. She just has such clear values about mm -hmm. how she wanted to move. Mm -hmm. And, and then she did that and she moved in the ways that, that fed her soul. She didn't seem like a person who was like parceling off pieces of herself in exchange for, for, accolades it was very she just seemed so rooted in her values and lived those suckers out and her values are things that i admire like courage and excellence and authenticity and not treating people like crap like she just is a, just an amazing just grounded and, and just human being oh i love me some my angela i have things in my home named after her oh <laughs> <laughs> I have You're a citrine ring, by, a citrine ring named Maya, and I love to put it on and just sit there and be like, I'm with Maya today. Yeah, you know what's <laughs> so great about her is like, I think nowadays, like we look at activism as being like this hard practice, you know, mm. like we got to be hard with each other and like, you know, we always got to be ready for the fight which we do in a, in a sense, like we're up against the struggle, but we don't have to be mean to each other and beat each other down to do it. And I think with her, like she was an activist. I mean, she was on the ground fighting, but she kind of had this, like, she could do it from a place of love and kindness that she didn't give up. And I just, I, I miss that. And I, mm -hmm. I want to see more of that, you know, and I, you know, I think that sometimes we're on social media, we have this, we're getting to this place of like this performative anger, like we show strength by like shouting people down or canceling them or dragging them and stuff. And I mean, like I was guilty of that stuff at one time too. <laughs> but you know, it's like, I like to think I've matured in my older age where it's just kind of like, that really does nothing for me. You know, if I find that you're just giving me the wrong vibe, I just, you know, put distance, you know, like, okay, just go over there, you know, to yes. laugh, I'm up over here, you know, you know, get that love to where, and, and just bring that loving energy to the people and to the places that need it and nurture and it's provide nurturing. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. I, absolutely. I, look, I'm not going to keep it expanding because you've been saying it, saying it all. Uh, I want to find out also now, it, keeping with this whole moment of another Black girl, can you tell, shout out another Black girl's business, uh, another Black woman that you think that we should be supporting, that you think we should know about, any oh field. Oh, see, this is like, I have all these like people that I want to do, uh, like <laughs> shout out, but um, let me think. Um, you know, actually, one of the people that I, I, I do like to follow is uh, this woman named Camille Peace Moskoff. She's uh, a jewelry designer, um, and she has this uh, jewelry business called Peace Images. And um, she creates work that is Afrocentric, um, but it is, um, I think like what drew me to her work is that she she also has a background in photography. And so it's like when you look at her imagery and like the message behind her work, it's peaceful, it's calming and it's soothing. And part of the portions of her work do go to uh, charities and, and, and uh, other movements for social justice. So she's one. But if since we're talking about jewelry, we got to give a shout out to Mary Tan's jewelry. Honey. Uh, always. See, because I know you always have Mary stuff on. You always rocking her. I love yeah. Mary Tan's jewelry. That's that's the homie and a beautiful soul. 
just a beautiful person, beautiful person. And she's out here doing her thing. And, you know, we want to support her, especially in these times, because, you know, it's like our artists need our support. So I definitely want to give a shout out to her because she's always been kind and loving. And, you know, I've always enjoyed supporting and buying her work and encourage all the folks to do that. So I'm going to give a shout out to these two women. Wonderful. Thank you. And for the people who want to support you, where do we find you online? Well, you can find me on Instagram uh, at Jamie Todd. That's Jamie with two E's. Um, <laughs> don't get it wrong. You're going to find the wrong Jamie. Jamie, double E. Double E. <laughs> um, I after the A. Um, but I'm also online at jamietodd.com. And you can find links to all the other things that I do, online store and stuff like that. But, you know, do most of my, my latest work is always on Instagram. So Jamie Todd, check it out. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Jamie, for joining us today. This has been another Black girl. Join us back here where we're going to celebrate yet more Black women and girls doing those things in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.